good to see the fellowship. Okay, so um, this morning, um, I just wanted to bring you a word uh, out of Ephesians, and uh, I'm setting a new standard this morning for our speakers, so <clears throat> this morning, I, I want to talk on who are you? Just give you a little bit of encouragement this morning, I pray. And, um, but who are you? And maybe by God's grace, we can move from who are you to who you are. Let's get from the question to making the declaration of who we are. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 7. You know, it's amazing it's amazing what God's done for us. And I just, I just love the worship this morning because, you know, it just so hits home, you know, what God wants all of us to, to know and to understand, you know, about who he's called us to be and what he's called us in, the treasure that we have in him, you know. And I'm just hoping, you know, we can get to that, this place, you know, that I kind of think of, you know, there's a cartoon character. Uh, I don't know who it was, but he used to say, you know, it's kind of like when your enemy's standing over you and he's, he thinks he's about to do you in. You've probably all felt that way from time to time. I know I have. And this cartoon character, again, whoever it was, he goes, he don't know me very well, do he? <laughs> you remember that one? He don't know me very well, do he? Well, the devil doesn't know us very well, does he? Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, Brian. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing and the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Amen? Wow, that's, that's huge, people. That is huge. And I kind of want to start this morning and kind of work from the bottom up. So I'm going to start here in verse 7. You know, that's how you build everything, right? From the bottom up. So that's what I'm doing this morning. Redemption through his blood. You know, I never want to forget why I'm here today. Redemption through his blood. It came out, you know, a couple times in some of the songs we're singing this morning. The redemption through his blood. You know how great a price that he paid for us. You know how great is the value that God has placed on you and me. Amen. That he would give us his own son to shed his blood. You know to come and, and stand in our place. In what was due us. You know amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. His blood right. And. The amazing thing is, First Peter, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You know, there's many things that in your lifetime and in my lifetime, a lot of gifts that we'll receive. But none of them will ever 
compare to this. They all pale in comparison. Now, I had the joy of being able to celebrate a birthday this week, and um, I didn't get anything. Really, by the way. <laughs> Not yet. No, I shouldn't say that. I'm wearing this thing, and I went to my in-laws this week, and um, my little niece, she knew I was coming, and she made a little card for me, and she, she uh, got some yarn and put this all together for me. And I just thought, you know, isn't that awesome? You know, like, there, there's nothing, you know, like they often say, right? There's nothing like homemade. And it's just like, you know, that really blessed me. I just thought about that. And, you know, how much more, how much more is God thinking about you? How much more, how much greater is the gift that he has given you through his blood, that he shed his blood for you, shed his blood for me? You know, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And, you know, we're all here this morning because, you know, we have stuff in our lives, stuff that we've been dealing with, struggles, wrestles, whatever, and, and they can even be curses. You know, and curses are real. And I, I love that I heard this so long ago. A person said to me, you know how real curses are? Curses are so real that Jesus had to become a curse for you and me. That's how real they are. And, you know, there's things that, that we can do or we can have in our lives that God wants to get those things out so that, you know, we're not giving an open door. Because the interesting thing here. It says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And the enemy is always looking for a legal right to come in to our lives. And, you know, I remember I remember um, shortly after I got saved, well, before I, I got saved, I got this gift. It was a little troll. My brother probably stood about that high. I had long hair and the ugly face. You've probably seen him. And I had that thing for three or four years. My brother had done this kind of world trip after he finished college and brought this nice gift home for me. And uh, so I had that thing sitting, you know, on my shelf and all that and brought it to college when I headed off to college. And so a couple months, I, somewhere in that area, after I got saved, I saw this thing sitting there and I thought, why? Why have, you know, how is that representing Christ? What, what does that have to do? And, you know, and we know, like, there's, there's, there's stuff. There's spiritual stuff behind trolls. And so I just thought, I'm pitching this thing. And so I, I pitched it out. I just, I got rid of it. And, and that was before I really un- even understood all this aspect of illegalities, you know, the enemy trying to find. And, and, and I don't know what things that I may have encountered uh, things that may have come on my life because that thing was there. And it's not like I was bowing down or worshiping it. I'm, that's kind of a next step, you know, that happens sometimes when people are involved in things like that. But still, it can give an open door. And so I, I just, I pitched it. I had, <clears throat> I used to love, I wasn't really a hard rock person growing up. I, I was more kind of that nice, soft love music, right? That was my style. I really loved that. And so when I got saved, I kept all my, back then cassettes, if anybody remembers what cassettes are, <laughs> I had these cassettes, right? All the nice love songs, Oats and Hall and all that, you know, and, and I thought after I got saved, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to keep these so that, you know, some point if I, you know, start dating somebody again and get into a relationship, I can, you know, put those on and play them, you know, it's nothing like some good, some nice soulish music, right? And I, I, I'm not trying to cut all music down, I mean, there's, there's some nice stuff out there, okay? But that's, that was my thinking. And then a, a couple months later down the road, you know, I'm, I'm going on in my walk with the Lord, sorry, going on with my walk with the Lord, and I'm just thinking, I don't need this stuff. Like, I've got what I need in Christ. And so I took my, all my cassettes and everything, and, and I pitched those too. Because I, 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 don't need, I don't need the soulish music to stir me up. If I'm coming into, you know, a right relationship with somebody else in my life, 
I want to build on, I want to build on him, right? Amen. Amen. And so, and there's stuff that, that we can just, and it's, I mean, the enemy can just use stuff like that even to um, just be an open door to get us to walk in relationships in a way that's soulish instead of a way that's, that's built on the spirit of the living God, you know, living in us. Uh, yoga, you know, it's a big thing now. And maybe I can stir up a hornet's nest. I know there's lots of people now that, you know, they get into exercise and that sort of thing. And, and, but, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in yoga. And I know there's, there's many different forms of it. I understand that. But I'm telling you, don't give an open door to the enemy to, to step in to your life. Don't give an open door, shut it. I mean, I'm just going to leave it at that. But, you know, let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit this morning. But there's stuff that gets attached to stuff. And we don't want that in our lives. I don't want to give the enemy. Curses are real. And God, you know, Jesus became a curse for you and me to redeem us from the curse. Amen? Redemption. People, redemption through his blood. Verse 6, Brian. Ephesians 1, verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. You know, oh, how you and I long to be accepted. How we long to be accepted. It's just, it's just something that God has put in each one of us. We, just, we so long to be accepted. We long to, to be long, right? Well, this is one reason why I brought this cup up. I did have a, a, a reason here. It says on here, and I don't know if you've ever gone to Timmy's and read it. It says, at camp, people believed in me. I'm going to take a drink while I'm here. In camp, people believed in me. You know, in our connect groups, we've been talking about dangerous prayers. Well, I think that that statement can be dangerous if it's not set in context. Many years ago, I was, I was really wrestling, struggling with something. And I know when I get up here to talk, I talk about a lot of my wrestles and struggles. Well, it's the way it is. <laughs> but amen, I'm overcoming. Yeah, that's right. It's life. But you know, in one of those struggles, I remember I was in Ottawa at the time, and I was out for a walk, just spending time with the Lord. And this thing just rose up in me, partly because of, you know, the place I was at, wrestling and struggling with this thing. And I just started saying, I believe in me. I believe in me. I believe in me. That just rose up in me. But I wasn't believing about the old me. I wasn't believing about the unredeemed me. I was believing about the Christ in me, the Christ in you, the hope of glory. So when you read this cup, I don't want kids think believing in themselves in the sense that they have it of themselves, but I want them to believe in themselves in the Christ that desires to live in them. Amen? Amen? And it's one thing to say that you believe in Christ But it's another thing to say, I believe in the Christ that is in me. Amen? Amen. Give me a hallelujah. Come on. (laughs) Because, man, we we can do that so easy to say, I believe in Christ. You know, I believe in him. But he wants you at the place where you're saying, I believe in the Christ that's in me. You know, we're big, people. We're big on the inside. And Ron's not here today, but... My friend Ron sits at the back where John is right now. He's filling in his place, I guess. And, you, you know, you might just see Ron as a guy who just who sits at the back. And, uh, but one time, you remember when um, our friend Gary was here, Gary Hayes was here and giving a prophetic word over different people, and he called Ron up, or we had Ron come up, and he just spoke to Ron, and he, 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 and he gave him the mic at one point, but he just said, you're a man of God. You're a man of God. And he gave him the mic and he said, say it. I'm a man of God. I'm a man of God. You know, because we need to declare that over ourselves, you know. And, and Ron, like, you know, the time that I've spent with Ron, and, and as I say, like some of you, you might only see him as a guy who sits back there. And we got another Ron back there too, by the way. He's getting scared, aren't you, Ron? <laughs> 
But uh, he said almost where the other Ron sits, actually. But, you know, you see Ron back there. He sits there, and you might not think, but, you know, the time that I've spent with Ron, like, like he has stuff on the inside of him. I mean, Holy Spirit stuff. And we all have our wrestles. We all have our struggles. And, you know, the interesting thing is, is that sometimes the reason you're having those wrestles, you're having those struggles, because Holy Spirit on the inside of you is crying out for something more. And, and that's, that was true with Ron. And that's true with you and me. You know, like, we're big on the inside. And God wants us to know that. He, that's why he wrote, had us, <laughs> the book of Ephesians in your Bible, in my Bible. You know, because he wants us to know that we're accepted in the beloved. I can say that I believe in me. God's been really helping me with that over the last number of years. I believe in me. I believe in the Christ that's in me and the hope of glory. Amen? Let's let's move on. I I, I don't want to say, who am I? I want to say, I know who I am. I know who I am. And when the enemy's trying to stand over me and, and, and thinks he's going to take me out, because, you know, we all have our low times. We all have those times when we're discouraged. I just want to, you know, just turn around and say, he don't know me very well, do he? <laughs> Amen? <clears throat> Verse 5. Having predestined us as adoption as sons, by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Adoption as sons. You know, in a sense, it's really a defining of being accepted in the beloved, I think. A further definition of it. 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Behold what manner of love that the Father has bestowed upon you and me, that we should be called children of God. Galatians 4, 6 to 7. And because you are sons... God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Amen. The spirit, you know, again, just sometimes when you're down, you're struggling, and, and, and you're discouraged just because, you know, Holy Spirit on the inside of you is crying out, Abba, Father. Because the Spirit knows where he wants to take you and me. Right? He knows where he wants to take you and me. He, he, he wants to take us from the place that we're at. And he wants to move us on into the greatness, into the bigness for which he redeemed you and me. It's important to celebrate what you've done right, even when you're discouraged. God wants you, you know, God wants us to be real about our mistakes, but he wants us to be balanced in our thinking. And, you know, as a son, as a daughter of the living God, you know, even when you, when you fail, you know, a, an optimistic son can say, 30% of the time, I'm 100% right. Amen. You might have only been right 30% of the time, but 30% of the time you're 100% right. I mean, you know, I'm just trying to give an example of, of how God wants us to think, you know, when you're down, when you're out. You know, don't forget about the God, you know, who shed his blood for you. Don't forget about the God who's accepted you in the beloved. Don't forget about the God who has adopted you as a son, as a daughter, called you into his family. And all the blessings that are associated, you know, with that relationship. Amen. Now, don't stay at the 30% either, okay? (laughs) The idea is to grow. So, 
in our, in our thinking and encouraging ourselves, hey, at least I'm right 30% of the time. We don't want to stay there. We want to keep moving forward. Amen. As a son, you know, it brings in a lot of rights that we have. And, you know, it's, it's a big thing nowadays, isn't it, for everybody to talk about their rights. You know, I have a right to this. I have a right to this. I have a right to that. People are, you know, filling up the, the courts with lawsuits because everybody wants their rights. And we're having a talk once after one of our men's breakfasts. I remember this specifically. It was kind of like a revelation I got in the moment. But Rod and I were talking. There was somebody else talking. And they were talking about somebody that was fighting for their rights or something like that. And I just thought, you know what? I said, we have a right. We have a right to be Christ-like. Aside from that, what other rights really matter? But you do. You have a right to be Christ-like. You have a right to pray. I mean, they want to shut you down the schools, but I, I just say we have a right to be Christ-like. There's things that I have a right, and as a son, I have a right to, to walk in and exercise my rights as a son. But all the other, all the other rights, you know, all, their, your, all your other earthly rights, whatever they may be, and I'm not saying it's not good to exercise them, but if in the process you're trying to exercise those rights, it's causing you to miss becoming Christ-like, your right to be Christ-like, then I say drop it like a hot potato. Amen. Amen? It's not worth pursuing it because it'll never compare to what you're going to gain by pursuing your sonship, walking in your sonship, walking, becoming Christ-like in your walk. Amen? Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Ephesians 2, verse 4 to 6, just kind of defines this a little bit further. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There's a song on the radio these days, and you um, may remember it. I'll be with you in heavenly places. Ah, come on. I'll be with you in heavenly places. I'll be with you in heavenly places. Well, you know, it's a great song. It's a great song, but it doesn't quite hit the mark. One day I was listening to that song, and I said, you know what? Hey, I think, I think the word says that I am seated in heavenly places. And, and you know, I'm not saying, I'm not saying the, song's, the song's not unscriptural because I will be with him in heavenly places. But the problem is, is that we can miss what God has for you and me right now. Right now, we're seated with him in heavenly places. I have an authority in heavenly places because I'm seated with him in heavenly places. And so much in, in, in Christendom, if you will. I, I really believe we've missed this. You know, everybody's, you know, the old time songs were, you know, my mansion just over the hilltop and, and all that stuff, you know. But right now, like right now, God wants us living in it. And again, you know, I remember when I was um, wrestling with something <laughs> and, and, and going through something and I was just praying, just pressing into God, and, and, and this verse came to me. You know, I'm seated in heavenly places. And then it's like the Lord reminded me of Ephesians chapter, or sorry, Psalm chapter 2. And it says, why do the nations rage and the people's plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves 
And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. And I thought, hey, I'm seated there with him. I can laugh. I can laugh. And I started, you know, laughing. Like I just, you know, didn't even even really feel like laughing in one sense at the time you know how it is when you're in the midst of something but I just I did that I just exercised that and just started laughing because we can laugh at the enemy you know whatever the enemy's trying to do and whatever he's trying to bring against you or your loved ones or whatever's going on in your family you know we can laugh at the enemy because we're seated with him in heavenly places we have an authority in the heavenly places You know, when Jesus died on the cross, it's amazing. He didn't just take your place. He also gave you his place. Isn't that awesome? He didn't just take your place as a sinner. Then he gave you his place. Now, let's just understand, he's still the most high, right? We're under his rule. But he's given you and I a place of rulership. He's invited us to rule and reign with him in his kingdom that he's establishing on the earth and that he's going to bring in fulfillment. So he not only died and took your place, he's given you his place. And he's just saying, come on, church, let's step into it. Let's step into it. Let's let's move forward in it. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 And we've heard this many times. You know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. You know, Paul's encouraging us there, writing to the Ephesians and saying, you know, our wrestle is happening in heavenly places. You know, you're not just wrestling against flesh and blood. It's not just an earthly thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's a thing that's happening up there. Well, how can you wrestle, you know, against those things unless you're also there, right? We're, and we're seated. God has seated you and me in heavenly places with him. And I, and you and I have an authority, you know, in the spirit. That's, you know, that's why we pray. That's why we press in and things, you know, that's why we seek God and things. Because God's given you and me an authority, and he wants us to use it. He wants us to walk in it. He wants us to step into it. You know, he wants us to make a difference out there in the street. You know, he wants to see these precious girls that that Jesse's talking about. You know, he wants them to know who they are in Christ. Amen. The place that they have, the place that they can have. So let's put on our armor. Let's go into our inheritance. You know, we've, we've been given an inheritance. But, you know, it may have been given to you, but you have to go in and possess it. And you remember, you know, back in the Old Testament with Moses, and they were to go, into, um, to go in and, and possess the promised land. And it, you, you read it again at the end, it'll say that, that God was giving this to them. You know, he was giving this to them, but they still had to go in and they had to fight. And even the, you know, there was the tribe of Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh that were on the other side of the Jordan. And Moses strictly commanded him. He said, listen, when, when you, when all your other brethren, when they go to pass over the Jordan to go into the promised land that I promised, you got to get, you're supposed to go with them and fight. You know, you and I, we're not just supposed to settle, you know, into our inheritance. We're, we're here to help other people get into their inheritance. You know, God has an inheritance for the person next to you. You know, whether they're born again or not, or whether it's somebody out on the street that, you know, doesn't even know Jesus yet. But God wants us to help in. And, and you know, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, and I really, 
it really hit me one day, but Joshua and Caleb, like, these guys were ready to go in to their inheritance. And, and you know, the other, the other ten spies that were giving a bad report, and they said, no, you know, the, the fortified cities are too big, and the giants are too big, and we can't do it. And Joshua and Caleb are saying, no, we can do this. We can do this thing. You know, if God is for us, you know, he's, he's going he's gonna to demolish them before us. And yet Joshua and Caleb, they had to wait 40 years, 40 years to go into their inheritance. You ever thought about that? It's like, why couldn't they go in? They were ready. But the greater glory was in them helping the next generation go in with them and take their inheritance. And people, you and I, we're not going to go into our inheritance unless we're helping other people to get into their inheritance. Amen? God has an inheritance for everybody. And he wants us there. He wants us helping other people to move into their inheritance. Um, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16 here. And I I just want to look at one piece of armor because that's another whole study. But it says there, Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. The shield of faith. You know, if in Hebrews chapter 1, did I give you that verse? Yeah, Hebrews chapter, or sorry, um, 11 and verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. I think of faith is the substance of things hoped for, the shield of faith that we're supposed to hold up. Then I think that fear is the substance of things not hoped for. And God doesn't want you and me caving into fear. Amen? He wants us lifting up that shield of faith so that we can move in. You know, to one extent or another, um, I would say I face fear every day. And yet, I'm learning more and more every day, you know, to jump on it and just say, get thee behind me, Satan. For you have not in mind the things of God but the things of men. And in Matthew there, do we have that one, Brian? I just want to look at this because it's, it's, it's interesting. It says, Peter took him aside and he said to the Lord, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. And Jesus was talking about how he was going to go to Jerusalem and he was going to be handed over, he was going to be crucified. They were going to beat him and abuse him and crucify him. And then Jesus says, he turned and he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. So my question is, was he talking to Satan or was he talking to Peter? I think it's right there. He's talking to both of them. Right? He says, get behind me, Satan. He says to Peter. Get behind me, Satan, because Satan was using Peter, and Peter had opened himself to be a channel for the voice of the enemy. And it's the same way today, folks. The enemy tries to come in 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 such subtle ways, and it's like, you know, Jesus recognized it right away, what the enemy was trying to do in that circumstance. And there's times where now in my own life I'm saying, when I'm saying that, <clears throat> I'm saying, get behind me, Satan. I'm speaking to myself sometimes, too. You know, I'm speaking to that old part in me that's trying to cave in to the fear. I'm saying, get behind me, you know, because I want to go in. I'm, I'm going to fulfill. I want to do what God wants me to do. God wants you to do what he has for you. He he wants you to step into that inheritance. He wants you to to do whatever necessary to step into the inheritance and help other people to step into that inheritance. Am 
my, uh, my nephew Joel, and I'll just close with this. He headed off to Japan uh, about four weeks ago. And so the day when <clears throat> it was going to be last, my last day seeing him, I just I said to him, I said, Joel, I said, don't forget who you are. And don't forget whose you are. God doesn't want you and me to forget who we are, whose we are. Amen? Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Accepted in the beloved. Sons and daughters adopted. Part of the family. A father. Seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He not only took your place, he gave you his place. Amen? So be encouraged when the enemy's rising up against you. How big you are. How big you are on the inside. You know, it's just, God just wants us to know that so much. You know, there's, there's such freedom in it. There's such strength in it as we grow into it and as we step into it. So maybe with that, why don't we um, just go into our communion time and maybe those who are helping with that, uh, if you just want to start handing out the, the elements, the juice and the bread. And Father, we just want to <clears throat> thank you this morning, God, for your word. And we just want to thank you, Lord, for just everything, God, just everything that you have come and have offered us, Lord. And, Lord, we just, we just love you this morning. We just bless you, God, for what you've done for us. We thank you for everything that you've stepped in. And, Lord, we want to step into to that, God, which you paid such a great price, Lord, for us to have. Okay, go ahead, Brian, if you want to turn up the music.